Get Kyle and Dusty over here and, and keep your eyes open. We're running out of zombie takeout. And welcome to Zombie Takeout, the B Movie and Cult Movie Show. I'm John. And I'm Scotto. And without any further ado, on to this week's movie, which is from 1985, Silverado. And of course, that brings us to the impromptu plot summary, sponsored by Aaron Copeland. He'd like his music back, please. And also brought to you by Western Tropes. You don't have to use them all in one film. But isn't it better if you do? <laughs> Helps if you've got, like, a stellar list of actors like oh, of course, <laughs> weird. Of course. <laughs> but anyway uh we, we get ahead of ourselves um all right so the, um we begin with a um a group of people looking to move west wagons west um well we begin with a shootout oh that's right, that's uh, right. Uh, I, I, you know, when a guy is sleeping we have um a shootout with a guy sleeping uh first uh, he's not sure who did this, why they did this to him, but he's, um, we have, you know, a couple of people just kind of wandering around, uh, the desert. He, um, runs into another man who's, uh, just sleeping in his underwear in the desert, pretty much ready to die. Um, he saves him with this canteen and, uh, he happens to have an extra horse with them. So they, they ride off together. Uh, they get into town ran by an Englishman. <laughs> mm. uh, and it, it's kind of weird how they have two different sheriff characters in this who pretty much hold the same law and order values of just yeah, looking the other way for people with money and mm -hmm. whatever. Um, but uh, they they run into their third uh, part. The, the party gets its third partner <laughs> when... Um, they, there is a, a black man, which wasn't actually that crazy to have out in the West. And there, there have been other movies with black people in. If this was just a couple of decades after, presumably, it's that, you know, presumably 1880s, 1890s, a couple right. of decades after the abolition of slavery. I mean, there there were ranchers that, that just want to get away from everybody else mm -hmm. and have a little piece of land of their own. But uh, in this case, it did not work out for him. And a lot of the times what I was going to say is that they sugarcoat just the racial plight back then. Mm -hmm. uh, it just kind of like, oh, you know, he's just like any of us. I mean, the only oddity here is that there are our heroes, of course, uh, you know, see him as an, an equal pretty much. Uh, but he is, of course, discriminated against in this town. And uh, they, they kick him out of town. And, uh, of course, we meet him again later because we find out that uh, our hero, uh, Scott Glenn, or Emmett, is uh, his, there to see his brother, who is the man who is about to be hung. So, of course, Western trope number one. You got a man being, you know, facing a hanging. <laughs> <laughs> in a rare role that I didn't mind Costner in. Well, right. You know, this is a very strange thing. Maybe it's because he's acting like an asshole or Maybe. he's supposed to be annoying, but mm -hmm. he isn't annoying. <laughs> I don't know. It's the very weird Zen Kevin Costner thing. Although, I, I think this is before he became annoying, honestly. This is true. That's, my, this, this that's was, my theory. If I'm not mistaken, this was before uh, Dances with Waltz. Oh, way before. Yeah. Th this is three years before Bull Durham. Okay. So he goes, and think about this, in three years he goes from playing the idiot young brother to the over-the-hill <laughs> minor uh -huh. leaguer. Of course, he's like 30 at this point, so he's kind of, he just looks ridiculously young. Right, right. <laughs> for 30. But anyway, uh, yeah, he's kind of the buffoon. He, um, he kissed somebody's woman and uh, wound up, of course, getting in a gunfight and killing some people. And, of course, they have to break him out. But um, Kevin Klein, the gambler, <laughs> each each person kind of has their, their thing. You know, you have, um, I guess, Emmett's like the, the caretaker. You know, mm -hmm. Kevin he's, Costner. He's the, 
uh, uh, um, Glenn is kind of like Emmett is kind of like the the um, kung fu uh, David Carradine's character. Yes, he's. I, you know, I thought it was David Carradine at first. Yeah. Actually, I was like, I don't remember David Carradine in this. And then I had to look up. Oh, oh, okay. He's but he's yes. very very zen, very kind of monastic almost. Right. He's he's the caretaker. Kevin Klein's the gambler. Um, uh, I guess Cost- Costner's the fuck up. Yeah, Costner's the the wild one. Um, so I mean, it's a very you know magnificent seven sort of thing. And and you uh, mentioned the party. It is very much that kind of story. It is. It is. Uh, Danny Glover is you know the the sharpshooter. You know, I, I I don't know what what role he really has in the group. I mean, he's he's the ranger. He is, isn't he? He he's the ranger. He's the guy that that knows shit and and he's gets he's, shit done. he's the ranger. Um, Glenn Emmett is the tank. Um, yes. It, um, Kevin Klein uh, is the bard, effectively. Um, yeah, yeah. A, and and Costner is the rogue. Yeah, that's it. That is it. I mean, it, it, it so easily translates into this movie, which I guess is kind of the appeal of it in the end, <laughs> but. So, I, it's a very long story, though, for me to get to this plot yes. summary. <laughs> I mean, it is like over two hours, but they, they managed to pack a lot into it. It's a very epic story. In fact, I was kind of thinking, wouldn't this have been more effective if they had said some years went by yep. throughout some of it because so much happens? And you're like, wait a minute, how much, like, how long does this take place in from when they, like, leave <laughs> in the beginning? It I mean, they, feels they, like maybe a week. Right. They meet and then they just, I mean, is this just like a few days out West you know, back then or what? But, um, all right. So the party's together because, uh, when they break out, uh, Kevin Costner from jail, uh, they run into Danny Glover, who'd been staying out of town, who luckily had been staying out of town and picked off the uh, sheriff's party and chased them back. Of course, effectively, Ending my jurisdiction here. <laughs> One of John Cleese's great best lines. <laughs> Although his first line, I think, is my favorite. Oh, what? Uh, What's all this then? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Straight out of Python. Yes, yes. Yeah, he's very, uh, you know, very even keel in this, as, as many of the other actors are. But anyway, we... Um, so they run together. They, they meet the family that's traveling west. Um... They had actually kind of came across them when they'd gotten into town, but it turns out, of course, they had gotten ripped off. Uh, they, they, this evildoers had stolen their money, so they had to go help the townspeople get their money back, which is, of course, another Western trope number mm-hmm. two. <laughs> it would have been funny if they had just completely pythonized this whole okay. thing and just had Monty Python in the Old West. And, of course, they were evil cattle ranchers. Yes, the evil cattle ranchers, which um, they they still they don't actually introduce the main antagonists until you're about seventy five minutes in, and his death wasn't a big deal. And his death was not a big deal because, of course, it was Brian Dennehy that was the real yeah. When you hate even him. even though a lot of his stuff was kind of you know made sense, like okay, yeah, you know. I don't even understand why they made a big deal of him killing that other guy that pulled a gun on him. Yeah. <laughs> like acting like he's such a dick for killing that guy who's about to shoot him. <laughs> I was like, wait, that that doesn't make any sense. That was probably the worst part of the whole film, by the way. <laughs> they were like, You used to ride with a guy like that? <laughs> I mean, they were just going on like the nerve to kill a guy who's gonna shoot you. <laughs> Uh, so let's see. They protect the family. They go to Silverado with them. Um, they uh, conveniently make the pretty Rosanna Arquette, the pretty woman, a widower. Or, mm. I mean, a widow. Even though nothing really happens. <laughs> that, does, like, that made she, actually yeah, no she, sense for her to be a widow. She and Emmett kind of go off together at the end, but there's really nothing in between. Does she go off with Emmett? I thought she stayed behind... Or was it Emmett or was it um, um, okay. Klein's character? I can't remember. They anything. implied that maybe she might get together with Kevin Klein again. Okay. Like, but not really. I mean, he's not going to be a farmer. I Payton, mean, that's his name. 
yeah, paid. And he, you know, he wants to get with her, but she wants a farmer. Mm -hmm. And and he wisely says, "Well, that's not going to be me." <laughs> he goes, <laughs> off, goes off to manage the saloon, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. I mean was the most mature thing I've seen in the film. I can't even remember when. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, nope, I can't see this happen. <laughs> uh, so they uh, try to they stay in Silverado for a lot longer than they imply they're going to because. The thing is, they're going to leave for California, and so if this rancher hadn't done anything, most likely they would have just left, roll the credits, yeah. the movie's over, or the adventure happens in California. But instead, the ranchers uh, terrorize the, uh, the townspeople, kidnap Emmett's nephew, and... Um, I don't know what the game plan was, but of course they're going to come after his nephew, right. and um, they're they're going to kill a lot of people. And at some point, um, um, uh, Mal, uh, Danny Glover's character's father, loses his house and then gets killed. Right. So that, he's got that, a score to settle. Right. They 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 come and kill him. So of course, I mean, they make so many enemies. You're just kind of like these people are really dumb. <laughs> Why and, did you pick fights with all of these people? And somewhere in the middle, Jeff Goldblum shows up, which really yes. was unexpected. Yes. Jeff Goldblum kind of implied to be a pimp, I guess. I mean, he's wearing the furry jacket mm -hmm. and he's got the, you know, the fancy clothes and, and, but I, I don't know. He was kind of just a carpetbagger. Yeah. Yeah, he was. And uh, really fell into like Brian Dennehy's, you know, Cobb's mm -hmm. Sheriff Cobb's uh, plan really easily, because uh, there was a lot of money to be made there. That was the that was the greed, you know. You got the the deal to make with the the evil empire. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the deal kept getting worse and, by the minute. And you know, so they go after the kid. Um, and the actual villain, uh, McAllister or whatever his name was, McHenry, I forget <laughs> what his name is. <laughs> Um, he just kind of dies randomly in a cattle stampede. And then the big shootout is with Enahy. No, he dies. They they kind of foreshadow his death a little bit. The horse hoof to the head. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. But it was during they, the cattle stampede. Because they did the um they they tried to kill Emmett by like tying his feet up right, and having yeah. the horse run over him, but he gets free and, and just barely survives that. And then Emmett, you know, while they're chasing each other through town, he goes into the barn and while he's coming, and I'm sitting here thinking like, you know, the, the worst way to fight someone like this would be Ron Horseback in the middle of a town, hmm. except he gets up to the second level of the barn, jumps the horse out the window and hits him in the head. I did not off for a little bit. I may have even missed that part. <laughs> That's that's how he the the main bad guy dies. Okay, I mean, but again, that part. okay, again, it wasn't that special because mm -hmm. it was like, oh well, you know, he was kind of a bitch anyway. And, you know, <laughs> let's, let's see with the real guy, Brian Dennehy, and of course, leaving mm -hmm. us with the final trope of a western, the shootout, yes. the, the quick shit, draw. Yes, the shit that never really happened. <laughs> <laughs> No one's going to stand and wait for another guy to draw a pistol before they draw their pistol to see who shoots who first. And it's based on the old duels, which did happen. Well, right. That was That's different. a certain number of paces you turn. Right. It, it was timed. This right. was just, they stood there and, you know, it was a test of reactions because whoever had the guts to go first, you know, had the, basically had the edge. Well, I mean, it's not till like six years later where you get Clint Eastwood's Unforgiven, which, you know, spells out, you know, a lot of this, calls out a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, why would you do that? You just, you know, shoot it. Or, you know, people who, you know, died because their gun got stuck in their holster. And, you know, people, who, you know, it was Gene Hackman's character and that, that was just like, it just went to whoever had the coolest head. Right, yeah, yeah. Whoever drank the least. <laughs> yeah. Which I mean, the you know Kevin Klein drinking it up before going in to fight, 
you're kind of like, would he really? Um... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So hilarity ensues. Hilarity ensues. And at first, I thought this was going to be a rare movie from the '80s that didn't really have a title sequence. Because oh my god, of, it didn't it have a title sequence. It jumps you in with that that shootout at first, but mm -hmm. you know, while Scott Glenn's character, while Emmett is sleeping, and then it then you know. If they go through that, and then there's this long sequence where he's taking this horse that he found with a particular brand on it in back to a town. That's the actual title sequence. I I, I spoke too soon. But it, at least right. it was starting the story. It's very reminiscent of the good, the bad, and the ugly, mm -hmm. um, where the two of them were wandering the desert. Only like one, one's a captive, and the other one's, you know, riding him to yeah. his death, trying to ride him to his death. And and the thing that really struck me about the movie is it's very calm. It is. It's you know it's funny that it's like still trying to be a clean western where you know very few people get killed in the firefights. Well, not just in that sense, but the acting is very low key. Oh uh, yeah, there's not a lot of shouting and intense emotion. It's it's just very calm Except and mellow. Coster, Coster's the only. Oh well, yeah, because you know. he's the he's the uh, asshole. But right. and but what that does nicely is it really um, makes the violence stand out. One of my favorite parts is when Costner does the stupid like shooting at the guy, you know, going up the stairs, mm -hmm. and then Kevin Klein turns to him and just goes, "Shh." <laughs> but having <laughs> because <they're> trying, <laughs> having most of the movie be so calm and mellow, when you do get to a fight scene or shooting or, or some kind of violence, it really stands out and it really punctuates the movie. You know, it really dra it really grabs you. Yeah, which was was unusual. Um, also, the score really caught my attention, which I don't normally like because you know I like the score to be kind of in the background and unnoticeable. Yeah, it's kind of equal parts as I mentioned, Aaron Copeland and John Williams. Yeah, it's very it's very standard Western mm -hmm. fare. I would think. and and you know anybody who doesn't know Aaron Copeland, he wrote a piece called Hoedown, which every Western has has <laughs> stolen from. Um, I also while researching him. Um, I found that his name is spelled without an E. I missed a lot of jokes when Copland was released. Oh. I it, Aaron Copeland's name was spelled Copland. I missed a lot of jokes when that movie came out. Um, now, I don't know if this is maybe my lack of a historical knowledge or a continuity issue, but um, when um, Payton gets the cheap gun at the general store, because it's the only one he could afford, yeah. um, he also comes out with his box of bullets. <laughs> Which I thought was funny as hell. It's He's a very like, modern-looking cardboard box. He's in the box of bullets. He's trying, in the middle of the shootout, like, uh, what do I do with this thing? And it's a very modern-looking cardboard box. I don't know if they would have had those in the 1890s. I don't know. Maybe they would have been tin. Yeah, I think they probably would have been tin or wrapped in paper or, you know, yeah. heavy paper, something like that. I, that was a very modern-looking box. It just struck me as a continuity <laughs> issue. But, again, back to the acting, because it doesn't really match the genre. No. The no, cast does not match the genre, which I kind of that, love about this movie. That, that, that is the appeal of this movie. Like, as a Western itself, if you had, like, John Wayne in this, this would be such a shitty movie. Yeah, yeah. But because instead you've got Kevin Klein, Kevin and Klein? That makes it. Um, the only Actually, thing... you've got three people from the Big Chill in yes. this movie, which was the, like, the movie a lot of them did right before mm -hmm. this. And it was Lawrence Kasdan, same director. Oh, Kazan did Big Chill? This is Kazan. Big, Big Chill was Kazan. In fact, I, mean, I knew Kazan did Empire Strikes yes. Back, but yeah. I knew he did Big Chill. <laughs> and that. Um, incidentally, Costner was offered the role of Jake but in this movie by Lawrence Kasdan, in part to make up for his role in the Big Chill being cut out. <laughs> well, yeah, Costner was the body mm -hmm. in the Big Chill. Yeah, he like, his Big role Chill was... was them all coming for a friend's funeral. Yeah. And yeah, Costner was the dead guy, but they never show him. Yeah, his role was cut out, so uh, Kazdan offered him a role in his next movie. <laughs> but, uh, like I said, that makes it. Um, you know, not just the, the low-key acting, but Cleese and Jeff Goldblum. They put fucking John Cleese in a western. Yeah. It's just so insane. And, and again, his first line is, what's all this? That a classic Python reference. Love that. Um, the only actor who kind of seemed to fit the genre, but was only in it for the blink of an eye, and I'm disappointed by that, was Brian James. And they didn't even credit him in this. He's got like one scene. I was so psyched to see him. 
they they come back and he actually eats two because he comes back and they're like when they find out they ripped them off he's oh, okay. there too but he doesn't even get a credit for it like i don't understand why it's like a brian james cameo yeah, and yeah. yeah why not keep him in this and and the thing that that, that kind of acting does is it, it really kind of makes it a study in dynamics because you yeah. have these really calm, mellow, kind of very modern scenes, urban kind of scenes, and this big, vi- these big violent action scenes. It, it was just really very up and down like that, which I liked. Um, now, I think you missed a trope that didn't I, strike I me ha- until I may until have it. There's a lot halfway of halfway through the movie, and this maybe isn't just a Western thing. People die immediately from gunshot wounds. <laughs> they just drop and they're dead. I don't know if that's so much of a trope as just a. Uh, I don't, I don't think know. it really works that way. No. <laughs> well, it depends on where you get hit. You hit the oh, head, true. yeah, you're true. Done. If, you, if it's if it's to the head, yeah, you're you're done. The critical it, hits. I think the head is really the only one. I think even the heart, you'd have a little time. You'd have a Maybe, little bit yeah. of a reaction. Yeah, I guess so. so. A headshot would really be the only thing that did it, and none of them were headshots. They were all to the you know center mass. Uh, and you know, key advice to Danny Glover's sister in this: if someone points a gun at you and they're they're you know, dying, get out of the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't just stand there. <laughs> I have to say, um, Costner and Glenn as brothers was perfect casting. It does. They they really you could really see that. Yeah. The old big brother, little brother, just like oh man, what a. But there's a idiot. bit of a resemblance, and also just the chemistry. There's yes. amazing chemistry in this movie. <laughs> Uh, those two, um, Linda Hunt and Kevin Klein. Also, Linda Hunt in a Western. Yeah. <laughs> but it has this great first act where you kind of do get the party together. It's very classic in that time. Yeah. Where they introduce the main characters and then the action happens. And um, uh, I mean, really, though, the only thing missing from the earlier parts is that more people need to get hit. You know, <laughs> just not enough people go down. They they keep the body count very low. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, also, Clint Eastwood movies, these are not. Right. Yeah, no, I this, mean, is, like, this is not your typical Western. I mean, as much as we're going on about the tropes. Like, if you um, look at the Man With No Name trilogy, that is a hot... We, we had, like, drinking games with, like, the body mm-hmm. counts that you see in those, those movies. I mean, they, he just fucking, like, wait, levels towns and shit. And, and this <laughs> may explain what I'm going to predict will be a discrepancy in our ratings. I'm not typically a Western fan. And I really liked it. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, think it's the Western for people who don't like Westerns. It is a very strange western. I like westerns like this though that stand out, that are that go for something different. I mean, what Clint Eastwood did in the, and Sergio Leone did was at the time was something like super different. Mm-hmm. The Man yeah. with No Name trilogy because it was kind of like a the good guy was kind was not so good. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <You know>? um, <laughs> as, as much as they've become a trope now, they it was really one of the first anti heroes in this kind of story. Yes. Oh, definitely. I mean, it was kind of like the Back to the Future style Western before that, where they were wearing yeah. like, you know, ridiculous clothes and <laughs> stuff. And I mean, here he was just, you know, gritty. But this, this is something different. It, this is like a very 80s style Western, oh, yeah, yeah. you know? Um, um, one scene I loved early on, um, Kevin, Kevin Klein when he's found in the desert, which was a very Python kind of scene. I, I, I would have, you know, pictured that in something like Life of Brian. When he was just laying in the desert in his underwear, um, when he when he gets to town, he mentions that he lost his hat. This is black hat with the silver. Yeah. Band. At one point, he has this cheap hat that yeah you know, Emmett had given him, and then he sees his hat on somebody in in a saloon you know, playing cards. I wish that had gone on throughout the entire movie of him just <laughs> finding guys with his stuff. Yeah, yeah. But he walks in, takes the hat he had on, puts it on somebody else's head. I loved that because yeah. he knew he was getting his hat back. <laughs> I, I wish that had lasted longer because I love the quest of getting his shit yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. You know, I wish you know, he found someone with his dog or whatever. <laughs> now they kind of head faked us. Cause I thought when they, you know, came to that, that um, party that was that, that family that was traveling to Silverado, um, they were going to go in, you know, three quarter, three of them were going to go in one way and they were going to leave Jake behind with the family. Yeah. And I kind of thought that that was, they were kind of going to write Costner out for a while. But they didn't. Right. 
Well, yeah, they kept they kept splitting up. <laughs> just they kept splitting the party. Like they they make this big deal of putting them together, but then they kept splitting them up. Uh, I guess they did have their own things to handle in Silverado, yeah, but makes sense. Um, they, they kept bringing them back together. This is really also. This is also the only time I've really seen Danny Glover play intimidating. <laughs> yeah, because he's normally Mont- Marta. You know, Mar- <laughs> he's normally old and bored, and you know, just worn out. This is you know not not much younger, obviously, than with the weapon, but you know, not much any younger, I think. But he he actually does play intimidating. He pulls it off. Hey, he just wants his fucking whiskey. That's all he wants. Mm. <laughs> And they wouldn't give it to him. <laughs> <laughs> Incidentally, I when Linda Hunt showed up in the movie, I, I uh, looked her up on Wikipedia because I was curious about her height. She's four four nine. She does have a form yeah. of dwarfism. Um, I also saw that she's from Morristown, New Jersey. Oh, nice! Which I was very surprised by. I thought she was British or at least from New England, given her voice. Clearly, yeah. she, clearly, she did the James Earl Jones thing and like you know designed her accent. <laughs> which she I does have that. She does have that middle mid Atlantic kind of sound. Why would she need to do that in this? I mean, there. I mean, they yeah. already had one British person in there. Right. That kind of throughout. It was kind of like a second British person in the West. <laughs> what were what were the odds of that? And for like one scene, she tried a, a, set, a Western set of draw, and it just didn't work on her. <laughs> now, of course, we haven't mentioned favorite actor Dennehy. Um, uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> He's practically playing uh, the character, I believe the character's name is Lopakin from Chekhov's The Cherry Orchard. Okay. Who's uh, like the morally ambiguous uh, capitalist right, right. who buys the land out from under the family. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, buys the cherry orchard to develop, you know. Well, he's introduced early in the film. He's an old friend of um, um, Payton's. And yeah. you think he's going to be a good guy. And then little by little you realize, no, he's the the capitalist asshole trying to screw everybody. <laughs> but I mean, it's so it's so low key the whole thing. Yeah. Like it, it's the least arch villain that you will ever see in a movie. <laughs> Which kind of made me hate him even more. <laughs> because he was so matter of fact about it. I mean, before the big showdown, he's sitting on a rocking chair. Yeah. He's just hanging out, sitting in a rocking chair. And of course, you know, they foreshadow. He's got the the badge off, you know, already. Mm-hmm. Kind of just expected him to give the badge to Klein and leave town, you know? Like, why why bother why bother mm-hmm. giving your life for this? <laughs> you know, if you're if you feel that ambivalent about things. Mm-hmm. Um, there's one actor we need to bring up because he was woefully underused. Um, Kelly, um, Peyton's predecessor in the bar, who was kind of managing the bar, was played by Richard Jenkins. Oh, did not Jane. recognize him. I looked him up on I looked it up on IMDb. Um, he, you know, he barely had a part in the movie, and it's Richard Jenkins. Granted, probably before he was Richard Jenkins. I mean, yeah. name was the same, but before he was really well respected. Um, we need to talk about the target practicing scene. <laughs> um, you know, um. Uh, Emmett's getting ready for you know to it was it was before they went back and like it was before he right when he got captured it was right before it, he it, got captured. It kind of turns the montage scene on its head. Actually, yeah. he's out in the desert shoot you know doing some shooting practice. I loved it. He's shooting the spines off of cacti. Well, he gets captured because he's shooting everything up, making yeah, all this noise, and then yeah, they would just wait for him to run out of bullets, and they come out and get gotcha. him. <laughs> Is that that was that simple? But I I love that he's actually just taking the spines, individual spines off of cactus. Well, right at and, first it doesn't look like he's hitting anything. You're like, mm-hmm. what the hell is he doing? And then when the camera focuses in closer, you realize he's shooting spines off the cactus. I just overall I loved how accurately and effortlessly the brothers shot. Yeah, they they almost were absent minded about it, and they would land a perfect shot. <laughs> Now, I did um, lose the plot about an hour and a half in. Like I said, I, I drifted off for maybe five, ten minutes. Um, clearly, when, when the, the big bad movie. was killed. Yeah. Um, I mean, 132 minutes. And I had to read Wikipedia to get my head around it. Though I'm not going to take that away from it, because I think if I had really been paying attention, I wouldn't have had that problem. Um, I, I, there was one weird music cue, I think. And as, um, most of the score was kind of 
typical and I didn't I kind of liked it um but there's a scene when you know they tell Emmett that um the bad guys have his uh what was it uh, his nephew yeah um they took the boy a- after he had been taken by the bad guys he's all bad he's got this big bandage on his head right and then he takes it off he takes the bandage off and the music just gets really over the top <laughs> Which I I really don't understand. I, I mean, first of all, the trope of they've got the boy. I mean, mm-hmm. it's just so like it's so out of place in this movie. Honestly, yeah. <laughs> of just kind of like we're just you know doing things together. Like what what is even the purpose of kidnapping the boy? <laughs> like so they're just to, gonna to okay. draw him into into something, which didn't okay, I, there was we'll nothing they were really gonna draw him into. Right. Okay, we'll get out of here. Uh, since you got my nephew, uh, we'll just leave. Bye. I mean, is that really? He already killed their father. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like you know how these guys are as 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 shots at least. Why would you kidnap his nephew? <laughs> to to uh, the, the the only reason to do that would be to draw him into a trap, but yeah. there was no trap. That's just what spurred him on to get revenge. Right, exactly. Uh, and I do love using an attack under the cover of a stampede. I'm not sure if yes. I've seen that in a film before. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't just under the cover of it. The stampede was part of the attack. Well, yeah. yeah he they... just took them off the he just shot them off their horses and the cows did the rest. <laughs> um it was odd seeing Goldblum play a villain. Well, I don't yeah, know that I've be... ever seen that before. Ah, uh, like he his for one of his first roles was in a Death Wish movie as like a oh. as a uh, a thug. Okay, <laughs> is I think this is the first time. I mean, The Fly is another story because that's you know. Well, right, right. Um, but I think this is the first time I've seen him play a villain. Um, it was very interesting. It kind of had a, a his appearance kind of gave it a bit of a book of Rabanz, I feel. Oh yeah, definitely. In fact, I'm like, why did they just give him the same outfit from Bucker <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bonsai? He was a cowboy. That's right. I forgot about that. Um, also, um, Jeff got a shout out. Jeff Fahey as Tyree, um, one of the, basically the the heavy, the henchman of the movie. Oh um, yeah. As um, it was his film debut, which is surprising given how considering how much they gave him, because he's a pretty significant character in the movie. Yeah. And and before this, all he'd done was a soap opera. <laughs> um, he was the first to die of the, the big bads. Um, love seeing him dying. Love seeing Slick die, because you really do hate him. Which I'm, su- which surprises me for a Goldblum character that you end up hating him. And oh, I will, the, the bit with the knife and everything for yeah, yeah. Goldblum was was just great. Yeah, yeah. You know who had it? You know where was it? <laughs> <laughs> There's a bit of a shell game going on with this oh, knife yeah. that, that um, Goldblum character walked in with. That Slick walked in with. Um, and of course, I love seeing Cobb die because I just fucking hated him. It was so satisfying. <laughs> and and then, then there's just the, te- the everybody goes off on their separate ways. Um, and and I think yeah, he, um, Emmett doesn't end up with the girl. He's just back to the, the monastic life, effectively. He's well, so yeah, just he left goes, to walk the earth. Goes off with his brother. Oh, uh, right, yeah, the brothers run off. That's right. And I think they kind of imply that Payton's going, you know. He's staying in the town. He he shows the he flashes the badge. He became sheriff. Yeah, but yeah, because um, like, maybe he'll make a farmer out of you yet. And he's like, I got a job. I'm this, which mm-hmm. means he's not going to be, he's not going to be a farmer. <laughs> no, no. And, and Mal goes off with his sister. Kind of a you know why does he just hook up with Stella? <laughs> well, I kind of like that they didn't play a romantic angle there because they could have very easily. I mean, it's, you know, the height difference and everything, it's, you know. Well, but they kind of, it was all but a romantic subplot, the amount of time they were standing together and how they were bombing. And I'm glad they just didn't take it that extra step. Um, No sequels, no need for a remake. Even though he says, we'll be back. Yeah. (laughs) On the brains. On the brains. I loved it. Like I said, it's probably because I don't like Westerns, and it is the Western for people who don't like Westerns. The cast is brilliant. <laughs> I love the very mellow tone and how it really accented the violence. And and I did lose a bit of the plot, but I think if I had been really paying attention, I, I, I that wouldn't have been a problem. I'm going five. This is one of those movies you, you never 
when you see on TV, you just keep watching. Mm-hmm. It uh, when, it hasn't been on TV in a while, I don't think. But I mean, when it was, it was one of those that like, oh, Silverado's on. Oh, cool! I'm still at John Cleese's part. <laughs> this is actually the first time I've seen it. So I'm <laughs> so, glad I you mean, mentioned, recommended it. The sad thing is, Cleese, of course, is only in for the first half hour. Mm-hmm. However, after Cleese, you get Brian Dennehy, you get Jeff Goldblum. Uh, it really, yeah, it is. Don't come for the Western, come, <laughs> come for, for the, the actors. Yeah. But I'd still recommend it. I'm giving it four. All right. And what have we learned? When it comes to old Western medicine, you're not going to be all right. <laughs> and I learned that the world is what you make it. If it doesn't fit, you make alterations. That was a line that uh, Linda Hunt's character said after they showed the uh, the ramp and you know stool that she uses or, or step <laughs> that she uses behind the bar. I loved that. <laughs> Um, that's it for Silverado. Until next time, we'll be reviewing The Gang That Couldn't Shoot Straight, which, again, is, I'm surprised to find that is not a Western. It sounds like a <laughs> 60s Disney Western. <laughs> I think you maybe mentioned it in the same breath as Silverado, so I made that assumption. Yeah. Um, that'll be next next week. Until then, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there you there are. You are. Get Kyle and Dusty over here, and keep your eyes open. We're running out of zombie takeout. Hello and welcome to Zombie Takeout. The be moving. Let me try again. One, two, three. Just take the whole thing again because I, I cut it a weird time. All right. One, two, three.